So uh, just a quick update. So this is the portfolio today of all of the things that we uh, are able to protect. We wanted to bring into this just some of the newer things since the last storage field day. So we now do protect Office 365, SAP HANA. There's a Cisco Hyperflex uh, CVD out there now, uh, as well as we added the GovClouds for AWS and Azure. So quick on the platforms themselves. So. Uh, like I said, the Cisco, the CVDs out. We have uh, customers buying HPE gear. We have customers buying Dell gear, running the Cohesity software. The uh, clustered edition is new, is 6.11, I believe, on virtual edition. So before it was virtual edition one appliance. Now we can do clustered VE. Um, that, there's a lot of customers who are asking for that from a, uh, a use case for acquisition where they need something as an interim before they decide which platform they're going to standardize on, for example. Then they can migrate the data over. Told you I was going to go fast. Uh, so when it comes to data resiliency and compliance on snapshots, the functions are the same. So what John showed you around data lock is, this, is similar. How it's applied is a little bit differently. So on snaps, it's a policy level, right? So we can set it on the backup policy, and it's data locked. From that point, every snapshot becomes locked down the snap tree. And the same things apply. So the retention period, the expiration, all of those things, right? But it does give the ability for us to go in ahead of time. Now, the interesting thing is it's a preemptive move versus a reactive move. So you have to set it on the policy for the backup. Legal hold, which I'll talk about in a second, is the reactive motion. right? So if something's happened, we want to actually take administrative control and lock that down. So this is actually what it looks like. So somebody brought, uh, Matt brought up the question of, of uh, storage ramifications. We do point that out. So if you set a very long retention or you put something on legal hold forever, Right? It's going to stay there and consume storage. Right? Um, it's very simple. It is a data lock option. The only person who has access to this is the security, the data security role. So the system admin doesn't have access to this. It has to be a, an individual person who has control over it. So when we get down to legal hold, it's a little bit similar. The difference is, you can notice on the right, we can do this on a particular run within the protection job. So if an event happens at this day, at this time, and we want to legal hold the previous run, we can, we can do that. Right? Um, we talk about this a lot with the Office 365 backups as well, because that's a, a huge use case, specifically. Uh, same kind of uh, message will come up that if the only time, now, if data lock is enabled as well, legal hold trumps data lock, because data lock can expire, legal hold can't. So once legal hold is applied, the only person who can remove it is the, the security data role. Right? So it's on, it's like the Hotel California. It's in and it's never going away. Until they, uh, they release it. And you can see here, slightly different icon, but it's on the run level versus on the, the entire job. Right? So we've legal held that one run uh, of that protection job. So something we talked about uh, last year when Helios was launched was ransomware. Right? So we do have the ability within Helios and the machine learning to look for ransomware now. Um, so as we all know, you know, ransomware attacks production and systems, it attacks the, the backup systems, prevents us from restoring back to where we need to. Uh, so how do we get around this? Well, first of all, Cohesity has always had an immutable file system. That's the first level of defense. So this is more a defense in depth strategy, right? Um, we can layer on legal hold and data lock on top of that, right, to protect it longer term or for particular periods of time. Uh, with Helios, we can look for pattern changes on the data sets, right? Did it, did it change over a certain amount? And we'll throw alerts for that, and John can show you one of those really quickly in the demo. Um, and we look for anomalies. And finally, this is what we want to get to, is how we respond to it. So one thing that makes Cohesity unique is the instant mass restore functionality. We've demoed this on a, a couple of different ways, but the way we do it now, John and I, you notice we don't do small data sets. We don't do five VMs. We're going to mass restore 60 VMs at once. And we're going to talk through that a little bit about what the process is as best we can. So with that, to get into Instant Mass Restore, and again, I'm going to go quickly through this. Uh, the traditional approach is to do restores, you have to hydrate as you go, right? So it's you apply every incremental. We all know that, right? The second approach is that you can apply, uh, you, can, you can have hydrated versions of it where incrementals are already applied in a sense, but you still have some limited scale and you still have to deal with the chain links. For those who don't know how Cohesity does it, every one of our snapshots is fully hydrated. So that means in a backup tree, if you have an, an hourly backup, every one of those is fully hydrated, which means we can restore them instantly from any point in time. Okay? So it's a very different approach, and it really is thousands of virtual machine capable. So to get to John's demo, because I know you guys like demos. You don't listen to me talk. 
Um, John will set this up as far as what this, the use case in the scenario is, uh, and then I think there's one other demo after this before apps. Okay. So, first things first, um, I've already taken, there we go, vCenter is letting me log in. So, you can see I've got this slew of devices. Let's call this a big app that has a lot of Windows servers and Linux It's uh, put together. And let's say I had a disgruntled employee who decided on the way out to infect one of the devices and watch ransomware propagate. And we've decided we've, we've shut them down already. So, our first response in this case, normally I would continue and <coughs> delete. Um, but in this particular case, I'm going to keep them there for the time being. I'm going to I'm going to build alternate copies based off of the in, uh, the restore feature. So I'm going in. I'm going to do my recovery. You can see I've already tested one of these. So I had to test to make sure it worked. So under here, I'm going to recover virtual machines, and I'm going to search by the protection job. I made it easy for myself. IMR for shorthand. I'm going to search for it. And I have this thing called IMR Demo. This is where we have the 60 virtual machines inside of the protection job that then once we select, I've got the option to continue. And as you can see a little bit, it kind of auto-selected the checkboxes for all the objects. It already knew which of the 60 objects based off of that protection job. I have the option of going back over here to recover as, and I have all my recover points. I can choose which recover point I want to recover this from. So say if I had a time frame in mind, I can go back to prior to that time frame and select that as the recovery option. So in this case, let's say it was, you know, I've, I've got a limited <clears throat> amount, but let's say early on the 28th, this thing bloomed. Maybe, you know, let's go for 310. Save that. Actually, let's not, because I'd only had five VMs. Fine, it's going to make me choose the last one because I was in the middle of building this. Okay, so you can see it says recovering 60 VMs in this job. Now, because I don't want to overwrite the existing, I'm going to give it a prefix. I don't want to go to the original location. I'm just going to try to put everything back. I have options here that if I have multiple vCenters, multiple data stores, I could choose different areas now to recover them to, instead of specifically taking them back to where they originally were. So in this case, I'm going to select my cluster in question. I have an option to choose if I want to put this to a different data store and then in the hierarchy inside of vCenter where I want this to recover to. Like the storage DRS group as well? What's that? Uh, can you select the storage DRS group as well or just a specific data store? Uh, I believe we can, but in my case, uh, you see I've got limited yeah. uh, limited and only single single volumes coming from, so I haven't combined them into, into a DRS. Okay. Um, but it, it's an option uh, from there, as long as it's a data store or data store, you know, the da data cluster, store cluster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, if, if I can get it from vCenter, it'll show up in that okay. list. Now in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to attach the network just in case. Um, maybe, it, maybe I found the wrong one. No, sometimes in this case what I do is I leave them powered off. But remember, the idea here is the instant and instant mass restore. The idea is we want to bring those up as quickly as possible. So, I'm going to hit finish. Now you can see 60 objects, we've, ad we've admitted the job, and I'm going to switch back to vCenter because some very important things are about to happen. You can see the, uh, the, the task for creating a data store. So this is where the view system comes into play again. We've created an NFS uh, mount point for this data, and what we're going to do is we're going to propagate that across the vSphere cluster, and then we're going to start creating the virtual machine objects off of, off of the data that we have in the backup set. So let me switch over to you. As you can see, it's already started. I've already started to recover a few of these, and they're already powered on and available. The, the, the difference is, I know we had a question in the past about, our, do we want to run virtual machines off of this platform? This is a temporary use case. Remember, I did tell it that I uh, eventually I do want to move it to another data store. So once these are up and running and available, then behind the scenes, we're going to perform the storage vMotion over to that area. So typically... <coughs> As this builds out, the, the, the response of getting the device back up and going and available 
doesn't take too long, but obviously the storage V motions can can vary depending upon what your what your endpoint source is going to be, um, especially if you're doing you know uh, an, an all flash VMFS volume or or if you're doing something like a hybrid mm -hmm. hybrid volume. What if that data store runs out of space as you're doing that of uh, the V motion? Then that's uh, obviously. Well, with this, because we pointed to one object, mm -hmm. you know, obviously that's going to fail. So you're going to want to plan that accordingly before you, before you. I guess is there any I, better question would have been: Is there any kind of recommendation that if I chose something that wouldn't have enough capacity, is Cohesity aware of that, or would it let me choose something that has like 10 gigs free and I'm trying to restore 50 plus VMs? I have not tested that, but I'm I'm hoping that's in there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll I, gladly break our lab to yeah. test that. Though. Yeah, <laughs> not not today, but yeah, maybe. yeah. 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 Not like Sorry, we, so we do a we do a free space check on the data store. Okay, so uh, rather than continue to elongate this through the the sixty, you can see we're we're recovering these and making them available. What I should know <laughs> is the fact that when you do look at the the storage, you can see that's coming from a Cohesity NFS mount point. That's not okay. coming from okay. the, from the uh, in this lab, a Nimble or, a, or a, a Tintree array that we have from there. So it's specifically coming from the Cohesity platform. Once the 60 are complete, it'll start the, the storage my uh, vMotion over to the final destination. Now, I ran this this morning. This 60 took roughly from start to finish about 56 minutes. Um, obviously, the time period is going to elongate at scale, but the idea initially is to bring up as many of those VMs as possible up front. So, that being said, what I did want to at least show, I know I'm going to annoy some folks here with this, but uh, Helios. Oh, uh, the, is there any way you can prioritize which VMs are brought up first? In this case, this is, I do not believe so. So, it's just kind of making its own list as, as it goes along. However, that does sound like a good feature and function to add to the system later. <laughs> All right, so one of the things to note, let me change the context. Uh, what I wanted to at least show you in Helios is what one of the examples of uh, the potential ransomware attack. And the idea here is we get these, error mes uh, these messages and alerts called data ingest anomaly alert. Now the idea here is when we click on one of these, you can see that over the course of seven days, we've determined a particular pattern of utilization um, on, on that particular device based off of the backup jobs that we've, that we've ran on it. And what's happening, as you can see here, is it now is saying that it expected, at least in this particular virtual machine, it expected only a growth of half a meg, but it observed 3.7 meg. So it's more proportional based. Not as, not a, I mean, I could find one somewhere that, you know, a, a gig and a half versus 37 meg over the course of a day. Now, we have some options that are available. One is, hey, if you want to, we can start to perform an instant recovery. We will select that, select that device from a backup set, and we will start, the, start going through the UI to determine where we want to recover that particular device from. And on top of it, <laughs> it does its best guess estimation of the, of the latest clean snapshot, so it already preloads that snap in it without you having to go search for it. At the same time, we've uh, started to add some more inspection capability, so maybe in case this might be a false positive, maybe we just ingested a lot of data, maybe it was a large copy from one device to another. And as we expand the machine learning capabilities, the, the idea is we'll, we'll be able to tell certain, certain one of these runs that this was a false positive, so remove it from your, uh, remove it from your learning set. And hopefully over the course of time, <clears throat> it, it starts to determine like, things like, say like a patch Tuesday dump out, a Windows update dump out, or you know, you, maybe you did a whole Linux uh, OS dump out. So, so, John, can you change the instant recovery point here, I mean, could you drag that green button there to some other point in that graph? No. Um, it, yeah, it, like I said, it's going to put the best guess effort in yes. there, but you have the ability to always go back through the UI and, select and, 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 and then select the one you. that you want. Right. So it's just kind of giving you a little bit of a jump ahead of the problem. Right. So.